very good evening to one and all present today. On behalf of Study Circle, I welcome you all to the 96th meeting. Today, we have Honorable Justice Mr. M. Sundar of the Madras High Court addressing us on the topic and overview of Commercial Codes Act 2015. Queries from the participants will be taken at the end of the session. I now request Mr. Guru Krishna Kumar, Senior Advocate practicing in the Supreme Court of India to introduce our speaker and give the welcome address. Uh, very good evening to all the participants. Starting with the guest of honor today, uh, Justice M. Sundar. I'm, I'm sure it will be a bit of a surprise uh, for the speaker that someone has been asked to introduce the speaker. That was someone from outside of Madras to introduce the speaker. For me, personally speaking, it's a very pleasant but a difficult exercise because I am being asked to introduce someone on the standing and stature of Justice Sundar. The only thing that you do is you say the speaker today, the esteemed speaker for today, for the evening today is Justice Sundar and that's about it. That will explain the whole persona. Now, this, this is something which obviously will not be correct. Somebody had one day asked me to give a word of thanks after a very long and grueling session where speaker after speaker had taken long hours to put their point of view and at the end of it all, I was asked to give the word of thanks. I thought the best way to ensure that people do not suffer the ordeal was to say my thanks to anyone who had anything to do with this session today and I sat down. But unfortunately, I don't think I can do and I will not be doing justice to Justice M. Sundar if I just said Justice Sundar is the speaker for the day. Personally speaking, I just had a couple of thoughts to share. As a student, he was a speaker par excellence. He was in, in fact, an inspiration for a lot of us to take to debating and oratory. He has won at the state and national level several awards. And I can say from personal experience that his style of speaking was simple, straightforward, but extremely effective. And of course, when he took up practice, again, I can say from personal experience that he is a self-made lawyer with little or no background in the profession. He earned the niche for himself. And not many of you may be aware that he had actually taken up an extremely lucrative assignment in a very, very big corporate entity. And it was this courage of conviction to give it up, to resume his practice and reach where he did to be ultimately picked for judgeship. And I can say in one word, his accepting judgeship was itself again because of his courage of conviction. Because he gave up a fairly lucrative practice and dictated and governed only by his conscience that he took up, took up judgeship. And according to me, it's not a coincidence that not many of you may be aware that he took his oath in the name of his conscience as a judge, which not many people would very easily do. And as a judge, the kind of good work that he's doing is all there in front of you, as I said, said at the beginning. It's very easy to say the speaker for the day is Justice Sundar and that's good enough. I recall some judges saying how the bar is the biggest judge of a judicial officer. Justice Sundar's work is there in front of you. I can say just a couple of things Again, at a personal level, he's a perfectionist. He's an example of industry and intellect combined into one. He goes by the cause and not by the counsel. That's what some of, these are some of the qualities which I believe, which govern and dictate and are the highlights of his judicial career. I understand this is Sundar is going to speak to you about the Commercial Courts Act. 
and that too not just in one session but perhaps two three sessions and i'm sure the insights that he's going to give you are going to be very very useful in getting a clearer idea of how the commercial courts act functions and how in fact the commercial law the whole gamut of commercial law is administered and how and what the nuances of commercial law practice are over to the organizers for having chosen such an interesting topic and to top it to have someone as knowledgeable both in practice and as a matter of knowledge of the field to be able to give you the nuances of this field and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to be part of you today over to you, the organizers please we would like uh, we would now invite uh, honorable justice to deliver his lecture thank you uh, mr om prakash thank you mr guru krishna kumar so kind of you i'm sure it's more out of kindness that you have said such good things about me uh, it was a very very pleasant surprise for me uh, that i, I the, least, the last i expected was was uh, mr guru to be here and also introduce me it was a very pleasant surprise i should uh, thank the organizers uh, for that and uh, this session is definitely not intended for mr guru krishna kumar uh, mr rom prakash mr ashok pati and the likes who are too very well established because the reason is mr om prakash said we will do it in three or maybe four parts and uh, about 20% of the audience are law students who are yet to even graduate or enroll and about 50% with under 5 years of practice including Uh, those practicing in the subordinate courts and the remaining 30% are the established uh, lawyers and senior counsel so it is with this uh, audience spread in mind that uh, it was suggested that we will do it in three sessions or maybe four so that we start from the basics in the first part which we are going to do today and then get into a slightly uh, esoteric level if i may say so uh, in the second and third one therefore today it is going to be only on first principles and i am only going to give an overview of the statute which is a summary of the subject so therefore it is intended primarily to my fellow students of law because i believe that i have not stopped learning and i continue to be a student of law with this uh, i would just commence straight away get into what i wanted to tell you as a summary of this statute but one thing as i take you through the summary of the statute the statute underwent a major amendment in 2018 it came into force in 2015 23 10 2015 to be precise as an ordinance and then a statute with retrospective effect i'll take you through all that and on 3rd may 2018 it underwent a huge amendment vast amendments many amendments were made and post amendment some very interesting scenarios and situations are coming up i may share a couple of those situations within court situation in every sense of the term that may be of interest to established uh, senior counsel like uh, mr guru or uh, mr om prakash that may uh, really uh, be of interest and uh, i'm sure they will also be able to contribute uh, in uh, trying to get past uh, what kind these kind of situations which we are now uh, which we see are now coming up with this uh, prefatory note let me just try and tell you what this commercial courts act is all about 
take it from me this commercial courts act is not substantive law it is only procedural law please bear that in mind i will explain it like this to you whoever goes to a civil court will find that normally there are about seven statutes which come into play contract act specific relief act transfer of property act partition act sale of goods act negotiable instruments act broadly of course succession these are the substantive statutes which are applied in any civil court there is no change in these statutes these statutes are the same as in any other civil court when the statutes are applied and when a suit or an application when a suit is tried or an application is heard it is done by adopting the procedure under the code of civil procedure 1908 cpc we will i will continue i will from here on i will say cpc and evidence act when a suit becomes a commercial suit there is no change in the statutes there is no change in the evidence act in cpc alone three sections 10 orders there is some change and one appendix has been added the top please bear in mind that this commercial court act merely changes the procedure little when it comes to a commercial suit as opposed to a suit i'm just using loosely using the term very loosely using the uh, expression commercial suit for contradistinction as opposed to a regular suit let's take a regular partition suit a partition suit or a bare injunction suit pertaining to a residential property is a suit and a suit a, a, a suit pertaining to infringement of trademark we will call it a commercial suit just for contradistinction illustration so therefore when a suit becomes a commercial suit and when it is tried by a commercial court or a commercial division nothing changes except some procedures and those some procedures in cpc are three sections 10 orders and one appendix this is all the scope of the act is please bear this in mind whenever you look at this commercial court act and and this commercial court act itself consists of 23 sections one schedule and one annexation cpc as you all know consists of 158 sections 49 orders all the 49 orders are in schedule 1 to cpc and then you have eight appendices a to h capital a to capital h eight append appendices and of course one appendix has been added now by this act out of 158 sections 49 orders and eight appendices only three sections 10 orders and one appendix have been changed and one appendix has been added this is the scope of the statute now having put you at ease to say that this is a fairly simple statute one might wonder then why should there be two sets of procedures one for suits and the other for commercial suits is it something very novel or was it in existence earlier a brief history this is a little academic but then i would not spend more than 4 or 5 minutes on that uh, i think uh, uh, should necessarily know this this concept was there even in the 17th century 16th century in england law merchant was an exclusive entity which was deciding 
commercial costs. Then, the first commercial division ever was in UK, and that was on 1 3 1895. Just as Matthew presided over that and decided the first commercial cause between a cloth merchant and his agent. Interestingly, in UK, when they wanted to put this commercial division in place in 1800, somewhere in 1894, then the Chief Justice was uh, Justice Coleridge. Coleridge was opposed to it. He said, this makes a distinction between bench members as some who are capable of trying commercial causes and others who are not capable of trying commercial causes. And on that basis, he was opposed to it. Uh, that was his view. So therefore, he was trying, he was striking a discordant and dissenting note. This put things in hold for some time. And then uh, Justice uh, uh, Coleridge, uh, Coleridge demise happened. And uh, Lord Russell, Lord Russell was his successor. On Lord Russell becoming his successor, he took a different view. And the first ever commercial court sat in London, UK on 01-03-1895. And Justice Matthew presided over that. Then let's come to the Indian scenario. When did uh, all this start? Interestingly, it started with the 188th report of the Law Commission. In the 188th report of the Law Commission, the Law Commission noticed that several Indian suitors are being drawn to US. The reason being a suit takes a decade to conclude in India. This a lot of work was done and they realized from 2003 statistics was collected. They realized that a lot of suitors are moving to US and where cause of action may not have actually arisen in US but would have arisen only in India. The suitors were going to US only because it was taking 10 years for a suit to conclude in India. Then a bill was put in place. Uh, I, I don't remember the exact year of that bill pursuant to this 188th report of the Law Commission. But the then Select Committee of the Rajya Sabha found it to be inadequate. It remained in abeyance for some time and it lapsed. The bill lapsed. Thereafter, 253rd report of the Law Commission came in. 253rd report of the Law Commission with Justice A.P. Shah who was also Chief Justice of uh, the Madras High Court, and subsequently Chief Justice of the Delhi High Court. Uh, under his stewardship, the Law Commission submitted the 253rd report. This is the basis for the present statute, which we are talking about, which we are going to have an overview of today. Basically, this is to expedite commercial costs. Or in other words, reduce the time taken in disposal of commercial suits. And the technique or the tool adopted, suggested by the 253rd report is moving it from a litigant controlled process to a court controlled process. This was the basic tool which was used. This is the underlying tool for the statute and the statute was put in place. Prior to this, what led to this 253rd report is this flagship document called Doing Business Report of the World Bank. Uh, there, they did a large survey of about 190 economies across the world. After 190 economies were, or 190 systems were evaluated on basis of several indicia, 
they came up with uh, this uh, doing business report, which is a flagship publication of the World Bank. There, interestingly, when it comes to enforcement of contracts, out of 189 countries, at that point of time, India was ranked 186. 186. That is when this report and then the statute was put in place. Thereafter, the same report, the same body found that we quickly moved up to 130 and then to 63 in 2020. Five years of the statute. 2015 was the statute. 2020, the world body finds that we have moved up to 63. And by this kind of rapid movement, we also found place in 10 rapidly growing economies. This is the fundamental philosophy underlying the statute. This is to increase the faith of the investor world in the legal system, to improve the image of the legal culture here so that the international investor community or the business community has faith in coming to India. This is broadly the basis on which the statute, this is the edifice of the statute stands on this foundation. I've just given you a, a small little history and also why such an act was put in place. A lot of details on this. I don't, I've just given the most critical and crucial data alone so that you have an idea of why such an act. And before I did that, I have told you, this is only a procedural statute. No substantive law has changed. Any lawyer familiar with conducting trial in a civil suit can conduct a commercial suit. Take it from me. There is no difficulty about that. Now we will go into the statute itself. When does a suit become a commercial suit? And when does a commercial court get jurisdiction? Here you will have to bear in mind the courts are two in number broadly. The courts at the district level are called commercial courts. And the courts at the high court level are called commercial divisions. Please bear this in mind. The courts at the district court level are referred to as commercial courts and the courts at the high court level are commercial divisions. Now let us see when a suit becomes a commercial, how and when an ordinary suit becomes a commercial suit and how the commercial division gets jurisdiction. For this purpose, we may have to look at Section 7. Section 6 deals with jurisdiction of the commercial courts. Section 7 deals with uh, jurisdiction of the commercial division. Let's go to 7 straight away. Let's go to 7. All, 6 and 7 are almost identical. Only thing is in 7, there are two provisos. Those two provisos are not there in 6. That is the difference. Now just... Let us just look at section 7. All suits, uh, 7 is, the caption for 7 is, jurisdiction of commercial divisions of high courts. That's the caption. And the provision says, all suits and applications relating to commercial disputes of a specified value. Pausing here for a moment. Commercial dispute is defined under 2.1c. Please make a note of it. Of a specified value. Specified value is defined in 2.1i. We will look at both 2.1c and 2.1i. So therefore we'll read again as all suits and applications relating to commercial disputes to 1C of a specified value 
2.1i filed in a high court having ordinary original civil jurisdiction shall be heard and disposed of by the commercial division of that high court before i take you to 21c and 21i let's see the provisos also because they are very very significant and important see the first proviso provided that all suits and applications relating to commercial disputes 21c no specified value here please bear, bear in mind no specified value here no 21i here provided that all suits and applications relating to commercial disputes stop 21c no specified need not be of specified value Tip, but what, another requirement is there instead of being a specified instead of being a suit of a specified value another requirement is there that requirement is stipulated by an act to lie in a court not inferior to a district court and filed or pending on the original side of the high court shall be heard and disposed of by the commercial division of the high court now you may wonder which are the acts which stipulate that a suit should not be tried by a court inferior to that of a district court irrespective of pecuniary jurisdiction these are six statutes and they are the ipr statutes i will tell you that and take you back to i'll take you back to 21c and uh, 21i trademarks act 1999 copyright act 1957 designs act 2000 patents act 1970 geographical indications act 1999 plant varieties protection and farmers protection act 2001 that's called the pvp act trademarks copyright designs patent geographical indications and pv these six fall in one basket we can call it the ipr statute standing for intellectual property rights statutes and all these six statutes have provisions which say that a suit irrespective of the pecuniary jurisdiction should be tried only by a district court or by a court not inferior to that of a district therefore if it is an ipr suit specified value is of no consequence it will suffice if it is a commercial suit now the second proviso is very simple very simple and straight forward we'll read that and then go to 21a and 21c provided further that all suits and applications transferred to the high court by virtue of subsection 4 of section 22 of the designs act 2000 or section 104 of the patents act 1970 shall be heard and disposed of by the commercial division of the high court in all the areas over which the high court exercises ordinary original civil jurisdiction in very simple terms this 224 of the designs act and 104 of the patents act you may wonder what is what is to be transferred in designs act and patents act a defendant in an infringement suit can challenge the validity of the plaintiff's patent likewise a defendant in a design infringement suit can seek cancellation of the design registration and give given in favor of the plaintiff this cannot be done in the trademarks act it cannot be done in the copyright act it, it that such a such a provision is not there in trademarks act you have to go only for rectification in copyright there is a separate procedure earlier it used to be ipab you now ipab has been abolished i don't want to go into all that the point is second proviso deals with suits under designs act and patents act in the district courts where the validity of the patent of the plaintiff or the registration in favor of the plaintiff or design registration in favor of the plaintiff is challenged by the defendant and the law stipulates that whenever there is such a challenge the district court should transfer it to the high court and those transferred suits will fall under the second proviso Now let's go back to the 
parent. So leave alone the two provisos for a moment and go to the parent section 11. All suits and applications relating to commercial dispute of specified value. Commercial dispute is 2-1-C. 2-1 is, 2 is definitions. 2-1 is, in this act, unless the context otherwise requires, I'm skipping A and B, C. Commercial dispute means a dispute arising out of, then you will see, there are 21 plus 1, 22 categories. I am saying 21 plus 1, 22, because the 22nd category is more in the nature of a residuary category, which says any other commercial dispute, meaning anything other than the 21, anything other than the 21, any such other commercial dispute as may be notified by the central government. That is, other than the 21, the central government can notify any other commercial dispute and that falls under the residuary 22. So far, no notification. Subject to correction, so far, no notification. I think uh, Justice Vaidhanathan has uh, joined. Uh, uh, good evening. Uh, uh, good evening, Justice Vaidhanathan. Uh, I, I just saw him logging in. Good evening, Justice Vaidhanathan. All right. Now, this is 2-1-C. If you see this 21 categories, you'll have uh, ordinary transaction of merchants, bankers, financiers. Two is export or import of merchandise or services. Three is issues relating to admiralty and maritime law, so on and so forth. So, therefore, the suit should be the list should be in one of these 21 categories and it should be of specified value that is 21i 21i defines specified value specified value i'm reading 21i in relation to a commercial dispute 21c shall mean the value of the subject matter in respect of a suit as determined in accordance with section 12, which will not be less than 3 lakh rupees. It used to be 1 crore. In 2015, when the act kicked in, it was 1 crore. It continued to be 1 crore till 2-5-2018. On and from 3-5-2018, it became 3 lakhs or such higher value as may be notified by the central government. No notification so far. Therefore, it should be 3 lakhs. Now, in very simple terms, a suit becomes a commercial suit and a commercial division gets jurisdiction under Section 7 if the list is a commercial dispute, one of the 21 categories under 21C, and the value of the suit is more than 3 lakhs. Simple, conjunctive. If both these conditions are satisfied, it becomes a commercial suit. The first proviso says, the second condition of specified value is not necessary if it is an IPR suit. I explained to you why an IPR suit, because the six IPR statutes contain provisions saying that such uh, suits should not be tried by a court inferior to that of a district judge. I will just uh, quickly take you through one provision alone, uh, say 104 of the, uh, I'll, I'll quickly give you the provisions also. You can make a note of it under the six statutes. Trademarks Act, it is 134.1. Copyrights Act, it is 62.1. Designs Act, it is 22.2. Patents Act, it is 104, section 104. GI, Geographical Indications Act, it is section 66.1. And the PVP 2001, it is section 65. 
I repeat, 134, one of the trademarks act, 22, 62, one of the copyright act, 22, two of the designs act, 104, section 104 of the patents act, section 66, one of the GI act, and 65 of the PVP act. These provisions stipulate that an infringement suit or a suit under these statutes should be tried only by courts, district courts, or in other words, should not be tried by courts inferior to that of a district court. For a simple illustration, I will, there's, these provisions are couched in slightly different languages, but in some and substance, this is what it means. And therefore, they straight away get qualified under the first proviso to section seven without being of specified value. Let me just read section 104 of the Patents Act. 104 of the Patents Act 1970. Jurisdiction, because that's the simplest one. No suit for a declaration under section 105 or for any relief under section 106 or for infringement of a patent shall be instituted in any court inferior to a district court having jurisdiction to try the suit, provided that where a counterclaim for revocation of a patent is made by the defendant, the suit along with the counterclaim shall be transferred to the high court for decision. So therefore, section 104 beside of the Patents Act out of the six, besides being simple, becomes an illustration to both the provisos under seven, the first proviso as well as the second proviso, where a patent is challenged, validity of the patent is challenged, the district court will not hear it, the district court will transfer it to the high court, and therefore that will come under the second proviso to section seven. Now, you may now ask these IPR matters under which one of the 21 categories under 21C do they fall? They fall under 21C17. Just look at 21C17. A very simple, straightforward section. 21C17. 17 says, let me read 2 1 again. We have already read it. 2 is definitions. 1 is in this act unless the context otherwise requires. C. Commercial dispute means a dispute arising out of. I skip 1 to 16 and go to 17. Intellectual property rights relating to registered and unregistered trademarks, copyright, patent, design, domain names, geographical indications, and semiconductor integrated circuits. So therefore, straight away the IPR will come under 21C17. Now there is one interesting, before we go further, into some more basics. Before I tell you, what are the three sections, 10 orders and one appendix in CPC which have been amended? I made a chart. I'm going to take you through that. Before that, while on this, we'll just move away a little and examine one of the interesting situations which I was mentioning, which might be of interest to the established practitioners and the senior members of the bar. I'm giving you an illustration. Consider this. A trademark infringement suit is filed in a district court. It is 21C17, no difficulty, commercial dispute. The value of the suit is 2 lakhs. Let us say injunction, bare injunction. Valued at 1,000, injunction against infringement. And uh, Damages of, say, 2 lakhs only is claimed. Then it becomes an IPR suit under 21C70. It definitely cannot be tried by the district munsif. 
normally a suit of the value of 2 lakhs goes before the district court. It cannot be tried by the sub-court, though, though it is under 10 lakhs. It has to be tried only by the district court, by the district judge, because of section 134 of the trademarks. No difficulty about it. It goes before the district court. But does it become a commercial suit governed by the Commercial Courts Act? Please look at section 6. This is the interesting situation which comes up. Please see section 6. Section 6, as I mentioned to you, 7 deals with jurisdiction of the commercial division. And section 6 deals with jurisdiction of the commercial courts. It says, the commercial court shall have jurisdiction to try all suits and applications relating to a commercial dispute, 21C17, trademark infringement suit, of a specified value. This is not a specified value. This is only 2 lakhs. This is not a specified value. Arising out of the entire territory of the state over which it has been vested territorial jurisdiction. And then see the explanation. For the purposes of this section, a commercial dispute shall be considered to arise out of the entire territory of the state over which a commercial court has been vested jurisdiction if the suit or application relating to such commercial dispute has been instituted as per provisions of section 16 to 20 of the Code of Civil Procedure 1902. Now you will not find the two provisos in section 7 in 6. Absent the first proviso to section 7, how does the district court, though designated as a commercial court, exercise jurisdiction as a commercial court? An astute lawyer appearing for the defendant will say, please try this. Your honor should try this. No difficulty because it is a trademark infringement suit. No difficulty about it. It can be tried only by a district judge. It cannot be tried by a judge inferior to that of a district court. But don't apply the Commercial Courts Act. I will not be governed by the Commercial Courts Act. The sequitur, he may file written statement after two years from the date of service of suit, suit, suit service. He may take out an application for condemnation of delay. I'm giving you an illustration. We are going to see 120 days is the limit. And uh, after 120 days, the uh, defendant loses his right of defense. SGS contract, Supreme Court has already settled the law. Just as it is written. All of us are aware. But what will you do in such a situation? There are such situations which we may be facing. The reason probably is when the statute, this is just, I'm just hazarding a guess. I'm just hazarding a guess. Probably when the statute came in as an ordinance on 23, 10, 2015, it was one crore. And uh, therefore, this provisos, of course, the second proviso is not necessary for the district court. Second proviso is about transfer from district court to the high court under the Designs and Patents Act. First proviso, they thought was not necessary because it was one crore. Now, they, now that has been forgotten. What will you do? You may have such difficulties. I'm just uh, placing this for the consideration. I find there are 167 participants. I'm sure there are very established practitioners and established uh, seniors. If you have an answer, please tell us. If you haven't, consider at the end of, uh, in, in the discussion, we can consider this. There is one more uh, similar interesting situation which may crop up, which I will uh, take you through as we go along, as we go along. Now, what I will do is, before that, I'll tell you something very quickly about this IPR. This IPR appears to be a very important facet of this Commercial Courts Act. The reason is, as all of us know, 
in the Uruguay round, what is uh, popularly known as the Uruguay round, India became a signatory to what is called Agreement on Trade Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights, TRIPS, what is otherwise called a TRIPS. On signing TRIPS, we had to give more teeth to our IPR legislation. That is why the Trade and Merchandise Marks Act 1958 was replaced by Trade Marks Act 1999, but that kicked in only in 2003, 15, 9, 2003. Incidentally, I'm mentioning Act of the Year 1999, but kicked in only on 15, 9, 2003. And then uh, we, we replaced the other statutes with uh, new statutes, uh, including patents, the Designs Act, we came in with the Designs Act 2002, we brought in amendments and Copyright Act, several amendments they brought in. And then we came in with the uh, PVP Act and of course the GI Act, all these were brought in. But delay was still a problem. The Act was made a little more expansive, but the delay was still a problem. That is where the Commercial Courts Act comes in very handy and it gives timelines for every stage. And as I mentioned, the sublime philosophy, the bottom line, as in the 253rd report of the Law Commission is, from being controlled by the litigant, it is controlled by the court, including the hours of cross-examination, redaction of evidence, you can eschew evidence, so on and so forth. Before I take you through what the uh, amendments are, I will tell you why this IPR is important, just of interest, because otherwise it might become too boring, it might become more of a classroom. So therefore, I thought I'll just to share this uh, uh, something uh, very interesting with you. I mentioned to you about uh, this uh, uh, law merchants. I mentioned about law merchants, which was there in the 17th century. And then the first commercial court in UK on 1-3-1895, Justice Matthew, and how it came into force, those kind of issues. Oh, a very interesting uh, uh, point is, regarding this trademarks matter, the question as to whether there should be criminal prosecution came up for consideration way back in 1959 in the Supreme Court. The case law is 1959 Supplementary 1 SCR 639. And uh, incidentally, it was authored by Justice Vekatramayar, who went from our court. One paragraph, because I think, permit me to just read one paragraph, very uh, tersely eloquent, if I may say so, very tersely eloquent. And therefore, I thought, it is better to read it rather than me trying to articulate what the Honorable Judge had said. He says, the object of the above provisions, that is a criminal prosecution, the object of the above provisions is to protect the rights of persons who manufacture and sell goods with the distinct trademarks against invasion by other persons, passing off their goods fraudulently and with counterfeit trademarks as those of the manufacturers. Normally, the remedy for such infringement will be by action in civil courts. But in view of the delay, which is incidental to civil proceedings, and the great injustice which might result if the rights of manufacturers are not promptly protected, the law gives them the right to take the matter before the criminal courts and prosecute the offenders so as to enable them effectively and speedily to vindicate their rights. So this was way back in 1959. This was subsequently reiterated in the famous Vardaman rice mills case, which most of you are aware of, where they said that day-to-day -day proceedings should go on as mandated under Order 17, Rule 1, Sub Rule 2 of CPC. Vardaman Rice Mills is 2000. We'll just spend two, three minutes on this and then come back to 
the provision. A little interesting observation I would make and then uh, come back to this. Bardhaman Rice Mills is 2009, 10 ACC, 257. There, again, permit me to read just one small paragraph. In our opinion, in matters relating to trademarks, copyrights, and patents, the proviso to Order 17, Rule 1, Sub Rule 2 should be strictly complied with by all the courts, and the hearing of the suit in such matters should proceed on a day to day basis, and the final judgment should be given normally within four months from the date of the filing of the suit. This was the observation made in Bardhaman. Thereafter, you know what happened in the famous TVS versus Bajaj. In fact, uh, the prior paragraph in Bardhaman also, I, I just need to quickly read that because it is of relevance. I read one paragraph. I'm reading the preceding paragraph, a part of the preceding paragraph in Bardhaman. The Supreme Court said, experience shows that in matters of trademarks, copyrights, and patents, litigation is mainly fought between the parties about the temporary injunction. And that goes on for years and years. And the result is that the suit is hardly decided finally. This is not proper. This is the observation of the Honorable Supreme Court, which I'm reading to you. Then, the next paragraph I have already read to you. In the famous Bajaj versus TVS Twin Spark Club patent matter, which all of you are aware of, I'm sure you would have come across at some point of time. The suit is of the year 2007, 979 of 2007. In this matter was going back and forth in interlocutory applications, uh, going up in OSA and then intra court appeal and then to Supreme Court, inter court appeal, intra court, inter court, coming back and then the right as to who is to begin. Typically, interlocutory applications were fine. And uh, at one stage, this Vardaman Rice Mills was quoted by one of the honorable judges and said, This has to go on on a day-to-day -day basis, and Vardaman Rice Mill's principle has to be followed. I'm not reading that uh, paragraph unnecessarily. It, it's, that's the principle that was reiterated in Bajaj versus TBS. Ultimately, you know what happened to this uh, suit of the year 2007? 2019 SCC online. Madras, Double three eight two three. This is what happened. Validity of the patent is 20 years. This is what happened. The suit was withdrawn ultimately. Apparently, because uh, I don't know. 12 years later. Now we'll just uh, go off this. In contradistinction. You may be surprised to know another product patent, an endoprosthesis, an endoprosthesis used in cancer patients to save a limb. An endoprosthesis was the product. Product patent was subject matter of a patent infringement suit. Full fledged trial was completed and a final judgment post trial was rendered by the Madras High Court in CS number 562 of 2007. It's not reported. It's not reported. MC Jai Singh versus Mishra Datu Nigam Limited, Midani, and a few others. Now, 
please bear in mind that this is the first post trial judgment in a patent infringement suit in the whole of the country i can say this without fear of contradiction i have i i have said this in national conferences the best of the practitioners in 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 this area were there they all now unanimously accepted that this is the first judgment in the country post trial where the evidence was recorded by the honorable judge in court please see this and then it goes on the first judgment the entire evidence was recorded in court uh, just go down and show the uh, first page first page the you can come down a little the first page will do uh, the quorum and then the quorum up uh, the quorum parties and then you go down and uh, you will find the council you will find that except one uh, all the other council are playing different roles now all the other council in the matter are playing different roles except one uh, except one senior gentleman now this is the first post trial in india therefore patent matters are being decided only on interlocutory applications most of the time this is the point i am trying to make and i am trying to say this is also from our court therefore where there is a will there is a way it is not impossible to have a suit completed a very complicated here again the validity of the patent was challenged by the defendant therefore it became a counter claim so therefore two main aspects infringement of patent and the two validity of the patent was challenged both have been exhaustively answered by a elaborate judgment a must read for all ipr practitioners and after i had brought it up in some national conference the rest of the country agreed with me that uh, oh somebody says it's reported in 2014 uh, mr murli put it up na 2014 uh, 2014 scc online na uh, online madras page please 163 163 excellent so i am happy that it has been reported because uh, others have, i don't think even ptc has reported it uh, ptc has not reported and uh, the other regular ipr journals uh, have not reported it. so this much about uh, how this ipr segment is very important qua this commercial courts act and how it is not impossible to complete a suit in record time trial can be completed it is all doable it is not something not doable it is not something theoretical it is absolutely practical as a former trial lawyer i my as a formal trial lawyer myself i would say that it is definitely possible if there is if both the bench and the bar are in willing to collaborate and do the matter at the required pace because trips one of our commitments was this and uh, the uh, law being tweaked was one thing but then expediting the trial was another aspect of the matter which is very very important now what we will do is i mentioned to you that three sections 10 orders and one appendix alone we'll go through the uh, uh, slides slide one is commercial court sac 2050 here again one small irony and then we'll quickly uh, run through uh, very interesting uh, uh, before we get into the pro procedural law is always a little 
dull and monotonous. So that's why I'm trying to make it a little interesting. Uh, therefore, before we get into that, the very interesting point is, we call it short title. Ironically, you know what the short title was for this act when it kicked in as a, on 23-10-2015. The short title was Commercial Courts, Commercial Division and Commercial Appellate Division of the High Court Act 2015. Then on 3-5-2018, the title itself was amended. The title was changed from this long Commercial Courts, Commercial Division, Commercial Appellate Division of High Courts Act 2015 to the Commercial Courts Act 2015. So the short title now is short. We have a short title now. Uh, prior to that, the short title was as long as I read it. Now, section 16 of the Commercial Courts Act 2015 amends three sections and 10 orders and its application. Three provisions of CPC made inapplicable to commercial courts. Now, this section 16 is the soul of the matter. 16 says the amendments are made in the CPC and those amendments are adumbrated in the schedule. Just look at 16 for a moment before we go to the next slide. 16. Amendments to the Code of Civil Procedure 1908 in its application to commercial disputes. 1. The provisions of the Code of Civil Procedure 1908 shall, in their application to any suit, in respect of a commercial dispute of a specified value, stand amended in the manner as specified in the schedule. That schedule gives the list of these three sections, 10 orders, three sections not applicable, and one appendix. This is this se section 16 has got subsections two and three. I'm not reading it. It, it. it may not be really necessary. So section 16 of the Commercial Codes Act, read with the schedule, is the soul of the plan, is the soul of the statute. And now the important sections. Uh, one moment, uh, Mr. Rome. We'll have the earlier one, please. We'll have the earlier one. I'm gonna, I, I, my apologies, important sections, 6 and 7 recommend jurisdiction. I have not put in 7. It's my mistake. It was done in a bit of a hurry. Please add 7 there. 6, commercial courts jurisdiction. 7 is commercial division jurisdiction. So, section 6 alone, read it as section 6 and 7. Or you can read it as two separate. Section 6, jurisdiction of commercial court. And section 7, you can read it as jurisdiction of commercial division. And the 2-1-C is definition of commercial dispute, which we have seen. 2-1-I, read with section 12, is definition of specified value. 12-A was introduced on 3-5-2018, pre-institution mediation, where they say wherever no urgent orders are required, mediation should be tried and rules have been put in place. And then section 16, read with the schedule, which I now told you, is the soul of the statute. This is the statute for you in a nutshell. Then we'll move on to the next slide, please. Now, the three sections that have been amended are 26 to 35 and 35 capital A. 26, as you're all aware, deals with presentation of the plaint. 35 deals with costs. And 35A deals with exemplary costs or uh, the term used is uh, uh, slightly uh, different. Now, I'll just take you through 26, how it is uh, amended. I'm not going to take you through each and every amendment because that will take the rest of the night. I'm just going to deal with this and then uh, summary uh, judgments under 13A and the timeline for filing a written statement and stop with that. Thereafter, this can be circulated to all the members. And if there is any specific query regarding any particular amendment, we can reserve it for the next, uh, uh, next session. That would be the ideal way to do it because if we go through each and every uh, amendment, I think it will take the rest of the night. Just let, let's just look at section 26, how it has been amended. Let's look at 26. Section 26 of CPC deals with institution of suits. 26 as it exists says, I'm reading CPC as it exists. Every suit shall be instituted by the presentation of a plaint 
or in such other manner as may be prescribed. That is subsection 1. Subsection 2 is, in every plane, facts shall be proved by affidavit. It's there already. The affidavit has to be there. What has been added by the Commercial Courts Act to this 26, 1 and 2 is a proviso. That proviso says, provided that such an affidavit shall be in the form and manner as prescribed under Order 6, Rule 15, capital A. This, the proviso alone has been added. Already the affidavit is there. Only thing is, if it's a commercial suit, it has to be in accordance with Order 6, Rule 15A. Let's go to Order 6, Rule 15A as to what it talks about. Order 6, Rule 15, capital A. It says verification of pleadings in a commercial dispute. It has subrules 1, 2, 3. I'm skipping all that. It's just uh, procedural. What is very important is sub rules 4 and 5. 4 says, which is not there in the original 26, which is not applicable to a regular suit. Sub rule 4 says, where a pleading is not verified in the manner provided under sub rule 1, the party shall not be permitted to rely on such pleadings as evidence or any of the matters set out there. That is not there in the original 26. Subrule 5 is, the court may strike out a pleading which is not verified by a statement of truth, namely the affidavit set out in the appendix to the schedule. And the appendix to the schedule gives the statement of truth the format in which it has to be. So this much about how 26 has been amended. Now 35, I'm not going to read costs already there. But now what has happened is if you see 35 as it exists in CPC and as amended by Commercial Courts Act, it says A, what are the determinants for awarding costs? And one major departure, I'm not going to read it. I'll just briefly tell you. One major departure is cost can be imposed even on a successful part. An illustration is given. Assuming there is a money suit with a claim for money and damages. Let us assume that uh, money suit limb is decreed, damages is dismissed as frivolous. For having made a frivolous damages claim, court can still impose costs on the plaintiff, though the plaintiff has succeeded. That is one, one major uh, uh, change. And 35A2, Subsection 2 has been deleted. Subsection 2 imposes a cap. 3,000 rupees are the pecuniary jurisdiction of the court. If the pecuniary jurisdiction of the court is 10 lakhs, it can't impose costs more than that. If the pecuniary jurisdiction of the court is 3 lakhs, it can't impose uh, exemplary costs above, uh, 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 above its uh, pecuniary jurisdiction. That has been now taken away, which means uh, the court can impose costs even exceeding its pecuniary jurisdiction. These are broadly the three sections. Then we'll go to the orders. Order 5, issue of summons. This is very important. This and then summary judgment. The rest I'm not going to uh, take you through. I'm going to do, I'm going to take you through this and then summary judgment though we will run through the slides. Here, long and short of it is Written statement should be filed within 30 days from the date of service of suit summons on the defendant. Let us assume that a defendant doesn't file it. He can ask for condemnation subject to a cap of 90 days, which means the total is 120 days. Beyond 120 days, the defendant cannot ask for condemnation of delay. This was the example I was giving when I was mentioned about, when I was mentioning about trademark suit for uh, two lakhs to be tried by a district judge. An astute lawyer will delay the filing of the written statement and file it with a delay of one year. What will you do? You may have to entertain the application for condemnation of delay. 
Now, this was there in the CPC amendment, 2002 amendment. All of us are aware. It was brought in in the 2002 large-scale amendments to CPC. But what happened was, in Salem Bar Association case, the Supreme Court said, this is directory and not mandatory. The reason why the Supreme Court said it is directory and not mandatory is no consequence was provided. Now, a consequence has been provided. The consequence is the defendant loses his right of defense. Because a consequence has been provided, this 120 days has attained such sanctity that it has become mandatory. Because there was a large debate as to whether it is directory or mandatory. And the Supreme Court, uh, of course, uh, at the risk of sounding a little immodest, don't uh, kindly don't take me amiss to be sounding a little immodest. I had written uh, even before this uh, um, SCG contract judgment of the Supreme Court that it is non-negotiable because consequence has been provided. And in Salem Bar Association, the only reason why the Supreme Court said it is directory is no consequence provided, but here a consequence is provided and therefore it is mandatory and I dismissed an application subject to correction. But uh, I stood vindicated when Honorable Supreme Court uh, said that is the obtaining position. And the lead case law is SCG Contracts India Private Limited, authored by Justice Rowington. And the citation is 2019 SCC Online 226. 2019 SCC Online 226. So this much about uh, the written statement. Then we'll go to the next one. And this is about uh, pleadings. It should be as per rules of practice. The verification should be there. A statement of truth should be appended. All these requirements are there. We'll skip that and go to the next one. And then uh, the plaint order 72A has been uh, inserted where whenever interest is sought, specific detail should be given as to what is the breakup, what is the basis, so on and so forth. Kindly go through the amendment and we will reserve it for the next session if you have any questions on that. And the next one is a written statement. We have already seen that 30 plus 90, uh, 120 days and how it has become sanctus. And then we'll move on to the next uh, slide, please. This is uh, discovery, disclosure and inspection of documents, etc. Timelines have been drawn for every bit of it. And uh, you can see the timelines there. Earlier, there were no timelines. Now, timelines are there. And I'm going to give you a quick capsule of the timelines at the end of this slideshow. After the PPT, sorry. And this is the DNA summary judgment. There was no provision earlier for giving a summary judgment without evidence. Please don't confuse this with Order 37. Order 37 summary suits is a different kettle of fish altogether. Summary proceedings is another kettle of fish. Please do not confuse yourself with under chapter suits under Order 37 where the defendant has to seek leave and not just make a moonshine defense, or all of you are aware of the famous moonshine defense uh, judgment, and then five categories, two categories were added. All of you are aware of all that. This has got nothing to do with that. This is a, this order 13 capital A is a completely different kettle of fish. I'll just give it to you in a nutshell without reading the provision. Long and short of it is in a in a suit. In a suit, if the court finds that the plaintiff has no real chance of getting a decree, no real chance of success, or if the court finds that if the defendant has no real chance of successfully defending the suit, the court can record that and proceed to pronounce a summary judgment without resorting to evidence. This is one major tool. Several summary judgments have been pronounced by me on 
resorting to order 13 capital a this is a very very effective tool this is to ensure that uh, frivolous matters do not keep consuming the uh, time of the court uh, this is one very important one case management hearing is called cmh this is again very important because in cmh the court controls the trial the court controls the trial some illustrations are the court can say that two witnesses on the side of the plaintiff will suffice. Plaintiff might say, I want to examine five. Court will look at it and say, what do you want to examine? One, four, two, four, and then three and four. Court may say three and four are not necessary. Only two witnesses. And even in that, assuming one is a finance resource and the other is a technical resource, if the finance resource is going to talk about technical details and the vice versa, court can eschew that part of the chief. Earlier, all of you are aware that there was no provision for eschewing. If evidence has to be eschewed, we were resorting to section 151 CPC, inherent powers. Now there is a specific provision for redaction. One can ask for redaction. A party can say, please see, Two witnesses are to be examined. One a technical resource, another a finance resource. Financial resource need not talk about technical details. Technical resource need not talk about the finance resource. Otherwise, cross-examination and it goes unrebutted, you can even redact the evidence. So the trial is controlled by the court in terms of timelines and also in terms of who, should, who can be examined, who need not be examined, for how much time the cross-examination should go on by the clock. All this can be done in a CMH. Then we'll go to the next term. Certain rules have been amended, inserted, hearing of suits and examination of witnesses. This is only major point is there is a provision for written arguments. And written arguments is before oral arguments. It's the reverse here. Normally, oral arguments are given after, written arguments are given after oral arguments, summary of the arguments made by the council. Here, the idea is, once the written arguments are given, you can control the time taken in oral submissions. That's the whole idea. And then uh, the next one is, uh, uh, insert, this is inserted new rules for the affidavits, which I was mentioning. You can regulate, redact, and reject evidence, which was not there earlier. We used to call it uh, S2 and resort to 151. This can be used effectively. And then the next one, please. Uh, substituted uh, judgment or decree. This, of course, is uh, now become very relevant. Uh, the provisions of CPC, which are inapplicable to commercial courts. Three provisions in CPC. Please make a note of it. This is nothing uh, very, very... Uh, complicated. One and two, that is order 13 rule one and order seven rule 14 are because of order 11 rule four. Order 11 rule four takes care of it. Therefore, these two are not necessary. And then order eight rule one, defendant's duty to produce documents along with written statement not applicable because it is covered in the, uh, in the, in the amended uh, commercial court side. And uh, that is all about the amendments. Now you might uh, uh, wonder if you look at the timelines, what would be the typical timeline like? I should have made a PPT for that, but uh, I, I couldn't. I'll just quickly tell you, uh, 30 days from the date of service of summons, suit summons, you, we'll take the point of commencement or the record date as the date of service of suit summons on the defendant on the defendant. Uh, if you take that as the reckoning date, 30 days to file written statement, maximum of 120 days. Then another 30 days for inspection, extendable by another 30, nothing more, nothing less. Then admission and denial, 15 days from the date of completion of inspection. Then notice to produce, if any, to be decided in seven days. Then interrogatories, to be decided in seven days, then judgment to be pronounced in 90 days. 
Now, if you look at it, the a suit can be completed in 179 days from the date of service of suit summons. 30 plus 30 plus 50 plus 7 plus 7 plus 90. 179 days a suit can be disposed of. If you take the outer limit, the cap and calculate, it becomes 279 days. Say instead of 30 days, I take it. For written, for written statement, 30 days for filing written statement, I take it as 120 days. And uh, uh, instead of 7 days, I take it as 15 days for interrogatory, so on and so forth. It will be 279 days in all. A suit can be completed. This is how the timelines are drawn. I have not taken you through each and every amendment in the uh, to the CPC just to avoid the whole exercise becoming too elaborate because the procedures are fairly simple. I hope I made an attempt to make it uh, interesting. I hope I, I at least got a partial decree uh, in, 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 uh, in, my, in, in my attempt to do that. And uh, now, of course, uh, one important uh, change because of the 3-5-2018 amendment uh, is because of the reduction of uh, specified value from 1 crore to 3 lakhs. Now, there will be two tiers in the district judiciary. Please bear this in mind. Probably in the next session, we'll go more in detail into that. Hitherto, only the district courts were our commercial courts. Now, what will happen is the district court will also exercise appellate jurisdiction. There will be sub-courts, which will be courts of original jurisdiction. And the district court will hear appeals from the decrees of the sub-court besides the original jurisdiction. So that's one interesting development that has happened. And therefore, some notifications are awaited. They are all at a very advanced stage of discussion. And I'm sure once the discussions are completed, I'm sure uh, those notifications should be in place. Once those uh, notifications are there, uh, we can discuss that in the next session more in detail. Because once we have the notifications, we'll have more clarity on the two tiers. Because the two tiers would have been put in place. Maybe we'll have dedicated commercial courts. I do not want to anticipate and say anything in advance. But I can tell you that it is in the anvil. It is in the anvil. In what form it is going to be put in place, we will know shortly. And probably in the next session, we can look at those two tiers in the district judiciary and how it is going to work. This much about an overview of the Commercial Courts Act, a summary of the Commercial Courts Act. I've attempted, hope I succeeded in the end, in my attempt. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. Over to back to Mr. Om Prakash. Over to Mr. Om Prakash, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Yes. Uh, we will only request the participants to put in whatever queries they have in the WhatsApp group or the chats so that it can be taken up later. There is one thing which has come up is by Mr. Divakar saying, Lordship, if I may request you to please elaborate on the consequences of forfeiture on the part of the defendant under yes. Order 8 Rule 1 as amended by Commercial Courts 2015. What kind of elaboration uh, Mr. Divakar is looking at, uh, uh, I, I, I really, uh, uh, my, my understanding is, if a written statement is not filed, the plaintiff is entitled to a decree. The plaintiff is entitled to ask for a decree. This is uh, my understanding. Uh, if there is something else, uh, I think uh, uh, probably uh, uh, Mr. Divakar can elaborate. Divakar has just posted saying Order 8, Rule 10 would pick in. Order 8, Rule 10. We'll just look at that. Order 8, Rule 10. One. Order 8. Rule 10. 
procedure when party fails to present written statement called for by court where any party from whom a written statement is required under rule 1 or rule 9 fails to present the same within the time permitted or fixed by the court as the case may be the court shall pronounce judgment against him that's what i was mentioning he is entitled to a decree or make such order in relation to the suit as it thinks fit and on the pronouncement of such judgment a decree shall be drawn up provided that no court shall make an order to extend the time provided in the rule one of this order for filing of the written statement that's precisely i think what i mentioned mr divakar i said uh, the plaintiff will be entitled to a decree uh, hope yes. i uh, am i visible or uh, is my lord he says that his hmm. mic is not uh, working who is oh, divakar's mic oh, okay. i i'm visible na yes 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 is 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 there uh, uh, something uh, uh, in on my screen which is uh, making the screen shaky no ma'am it is perfect clear yes we so have i find uh, it's a little hazy if no, it is not so it is all right yes it is true thank you thank you then sai krishnan wanted to ask about uh, notification regarding designating principal city civil court I think as your lordship said, once this notification kicks in in the next session, your lordship will be able yes. to hire. Yes, yes, because that is at an advanced stage of uh, discussion, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Sai Krishnan. So I think uh, we might be putting the cart before the horse by discussing now. So once it is put in place, uh, it will it, it may take a particular shape, and then we can. Uh, I am sure uh, you have seen that Jibo four eighty, na. Paragraph seven, you would have seen. I'm, I'm sure you would have seen uh, Jibo four eighty. I think uh, government order four eighty. One minute. Jibo, sorry, very sorry. It is four fifty one. So sorry, four fifty one. Dated say seven eleven twenty twenty. And if you go to paragraph seven. a notification has to be sent it is at that advanced stage we don't know what shape it is going to take that is why i said uh, it's at a very advanced so once the notification is made then our uh, discussion will be very meaningful is it not mistaken lord uh, the notification i found that the recommendation was made for uh, designating the principal court as a commercial court but ultimately yes. the notification it was not contained no no that is uh, 500 mr uh, sai krishnan jio ms ninga solrathu jio ms 500 and the date is i'll give you the date 28 6 2016 that is prior to the 35 2018 amendment when there was only one tier we didn't have two tiers only on and from 35 2018 there are two two tiers in the district judiciary prior to that only one tier that time we did this duo ms 500 dated 286216 all the pdjs in the 32 districts that is judicial districts revenue districts are more in number now 32 judicial districts and wherever there is no principal district judge the district judge has been notified as a commercial court that continues but now about the commercial appellate court the jurisdiction for them and the sub courts that is where the notification is awaited pursuant to this jivo uh, number 400 and what i uh, mentioned to you now 4451 dated 7 11 and of course principal judge uh, city civil court has been notified that is 480 dated 10 9 after the reduction of uh, 1 crore to 3 lakhs pj is now uh, notified uh, That that is under a separate government order, which is operating, and uh, that would be four eighty government order four eighty dated ten nine twenty nineteen. Thank you. Yes, please. Lord Mr. Kartike Balan asks us: Is Section twelve A mandatory before filing the suit? Twelve A mandatory. Pre mediation. it is mandatory 
I will put it this way. The answer is yes and no. I'll tell you why. Theoretically, yes. Technically, no. The reason is, uh, somebody says, uh, SC has decided it is only uh, a directory. Uh, the simple reason is, my logic is this. Somebody files an ABJ application. Somebody says uh, there is imminent threat of alienation. I'm not aware of the judgment which somebody has put up saying uh, uh, Supreme Court has decided that uh, well, capital A is uh, directory. If if it is if it is so, please give the citation. I will also make a note of it. Uh, it that's a revelation for me. But no consequence provided for twelve A. No consequence provided. Therefore, it's quite uh, possible that the Supreme Court has said it is directory. But in any case, just file one interlocutory application and thereafter you can't say go for pre-mediation. Yes. Yes. Sri Charan would have raised a question concerning section ah, yes. 13 of appeals, but ah. I feel that there is some list which is pending before the division. Correct. So Correct. We will not uh, get into much. But that hearing is also going on. It is actually stands adjourned. Yes. Maybe in the next sessions, your lordship will also cover upon what appeal stands as it is under section 13. I think uh, I'll uh, I agree with what uh, Mr. Om Prakash said because it's being actively heard by Honorable Division Bench. So, therefore, it may not be uh, as a matter of good order, I think it may not be appropriate for us to discuss it when it is being actively uh, heard on the judicial side by Honorable Division Bench. Once it is decided, then we can take it up. But the point is only one appeal, no, no second appeal. And of course, section 100 not excluded. Then will 100 apply those kind of issues? And then de deciding jurisdiction is cannot be carried in appeal. Those kind of uh, issues are there. But now that it is being heard actively by uh, uh, Honorable Division Bench, and once the uh, order is pronounced, then we will have uh, then we will have a lively discussion on that. Mr. Sanjay Pintu had uh, raised something about the trademarks appeals before single bench or division bench, then whether it is CMA or OSK. Probably, I think your lordship will cover up in the next sessions when. No, no, I think uh, that may pertain to matters from IPAB. That is a separate bucket which is being dealt with on abolition of IPAB on, I think, uh, 4th April. 2021, right? Yes, yes. By an ordinance. Yes. And now it's become an act, I'm told. I was told it was passed by the Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha on 5th and 6th of August this month. 5th yes. and 6th and it has become an act. So IPAB stands abolished. So all the matters, from, at least from IPAB Chennai, are coming to the High Court. I think what Mr. Sanjay Pinto is asking is pertaining to that. Am I right, uh, Mr. Sanjay Pinto? Can you come on the screen? Mr. Sanjay Pinto? Probably uh, he is referring to that. Yes. That is being dealt with separately. Yes, my lord. The uh, lordship is right. Uh, uh, a large number of such uh, trademark appeals are pending before the registry. Uh, yes. They think that, uh, a decision is yet to be taken, rules ready to be framed. So I want to know if there's any uh, any update on that, my lord. Uh, that uh, that uh, we are at it. Uh, we, are, we are meeting on Monday. Uh, something is being done, uh, uh, Mr. Sanjay Pinto. Some uh, a committee has been constituted, and uh, we have, we have, we probably uh, might put in place some uh, practice note, and then embark upon the exercise of doing uh, the rules. The practice note, uh, something similar to what the Delhi High Court has done, because Delhi High Court has started hearing now already. So yes. we may start doing something like that. Monday we are meeting. We hope to put something in place in the course of the week. And uh, new matters are also being filed. And uh, what the nomenclature should be given to the new matters for rectification directly when it is filed in the High Court, uh, those issues are also going to be addressed. Thank you, my lord. Yes, please. Yes, please. I think with this, my lords, we may end the session. Uh, though there are a few more uh, queries in the chat box, I thought we will. No, if you feel there is something very uh, 
relevant not very relevant not mostly on the same species of twelve mediation other things one of yes. our participants has shared some judgments also we will have it circulated to all the members yes and this uh, ppt can be circulated only thing is adding that section 7 6 and yes. 7 jurisdiction yes and it can be circulated yes. so that uh, the members if they have any issues we can uh, uh, take it out uh, on a uh, one issue basis and uh, discuss it yes in the ensuing sessions yes but i will only invite now our young member at the bar mr raghavendra and who would like to have a few words of thanks for the session yes please it's my privilege to propose a word of thanks on this wonderful evening i on behalf of study circle audience legal fraternity and on my behalf extend a hearty hearty word of thanks for gracing your lordships elaborate and informative session on the overview of commercial courts act 2015 and also for sharing us with your findings and opinions today we enjoyed the captivity session which was informative and elaborate with vernacular details we are grateful to your lordship for providing us your valuable time and giving excellent coverage on commercial courts act 2015 i am also grateful to your lordship for sharing your knowledge and analysis on the act in simple terms which would be understandable by all i am confident that today's session would be a treasure trove to many juniors like me which would enlighten our path and guide us in understanding handling commercial disputes we are all inspired by your great words i once again thank your lordship for bestowing us with your wonderful session Thank you very much, Max. With this, we end it. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take you. I'll take you. Thank you so much. I'll take you.